Indonesia's cultural and biodiversity is remarkable. The country never ceases to enchant. This is a place where a person can understand the big picture, learn to go the extra mile to overcome challenges and experience sights and sounds that get carved into your memory. Holding the seat of ASEAN, the capital city Jakarta, is a rapidly growing business hub in Southeast Asia, harnessing marketplaces and technologies that drive demand. Bina Nusantara Group actively shapes this vibrant region, offering education of an international standard through Bina's primary and secondary schools and Bina's higher education systems. serving the community across the archipelago and beyond. Venus University, I believe it's a place where you can meet new friends and a place where you can grasp new opportunities. The teachers use a lot of discussion, so it's not just about a monologue in front of the class, it's really about understanding. First of all, if we talk about quality, you expect that qualities come from the inside of a person and for me what's very important is for students to have passion and to know what they love and we encourage that in our project. They have to also think about caring or emotional connections with communities that really really make Indonesia great. Uh, Venus Aso School of Engineering is a joint venture school between Indonesia and Japan. We teach not only Japanese language, but also Japanese technology and also business ethics. The Venus University is the most progressive private university in Indonesia, we think. So, and also the Venus University has uh, many partnerships all over the world. Three plus one, I think, is a very good program. I think very unique. Because we, we designed this one, uh, make sure the student, when they graduate, they don't have culture shock. So three plus one, I think one year they had to work in with us. We trained on everything. So when they graduate, they are ready for the market. They are ready for the job. They are ready for industry. Uh, my partner and I started up this business called Borneo Eyewear. It initially started as a group project while we were in Binos. I guess what is really important is determination, confidence, learning to respect one another and applying all that they have learned when they already graduated from the university. Venus, fostering and empowering the society in building and serving the nation. Venus University. In 2017, the Archipelagic and Island States Forum initiated. The Archipelagic and Island States Forum, or AIS Forum, is a designated platform to include 47 archipelagic and island nations focused in four thematic areas. Those are climate change mitigation and adaptation, blue economy, marine plastic debris, and good maritime governance. AIS Forum Secretariat has developed three programs that encourage innovations through research and development and entrepreneurship. Those are Joint Research Program, the Innovators Scholarship Program, and Innovation Challenge. We believe that the academicians play a big role in advancing R&D. Thus, we initiated the Joint Research Program between academic institutions to come up with breakthrough ideas that could bring benefit to AIS participating countries. In the second program, we will bring talented individuals through the Innovator Scholarship Program to come up with innovations that contribute to the economy of AIS countries. The scholarship program is a partnership between AIS Forum with universities from archipelagic and island countries. Last, in the light of COVID-19 pandemic, it is important for archipelagic and island states to have a resilient economy. Therefore, AIS Forum Secretariat introduces the Innovation Challenge an idea competition to find business solutions that can help companies and societies at large withstand a crisis situation. Many solutions to challenges that affect AIS participating countries in four main thematic areas and SDG 14 goals are produced through collaboration programs. 
These programs will explore opportunities through innovation and experiment that benefits on a local, regional, and international scale through sharing knowledge and experiences between AIS participating countries. Good morning, everyone. Distinguished guests, excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Bina Nusantara University is delighted to welcome you to the International Conference on Biospheric Harmony Advanced Research 2020. Thank you for joining us in the second day of ICOBAR 2020. We would welcome our honorable guests. Rector of Bina Nusantara University, Professor Dr. Harianto Prabowo, Vice Rectors of Bina Nusantara University, Directors of Binus Campuses, and Faculty Deans. We would also like to welcome our honorable keynote speakers today, Associate Professor Dr. Nanta Kumar Loganathan from University Technology Malaysia and Her Excellency Olivia Leslie, who is the Ambassador of Ireland to Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get started to the main event, kindly allow me to introduce myself. My name is Safira, and I'm very, very honored to be given the opportunity to be the Master of Ceremony in the second day of ICOBAR 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the conference a little bit. The International Conference on Biospheric Harmony Advanced Research 2020 provides great opportunity for researchers to share their research findings, share their knowledge, insights, even as well as experiences in dealing with living in harmony with the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get started, it is much better for us to be grateful that God gives us health so that we are all able to join this conference today. Therefore, I would like to invite Dr. Risa Rumenta Simanjunta to recite some prayers. To Dr. Simanjunta, the floor is yours. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Allow me to lead us in prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Alamin. Dear God, today we beseech you to keep us not away from your blessings, but to keep us away from your wrath, and that we may keep our faith to advance our lives. To what are we about to do today, when we find favor in your eyes, as only to you all praises and might. Dear God, we thank you for all your delights, which you have bestowed upon all your creations. Nothing will be easy, lest you make it easy, and there's no better protection than your defense. Robana atina fitunya hasana, wafil a hiroti hasana, wakina ada banar. Amin, amin ya robal alamin. Thank you, Dr. Simanjunta, for the beautiful prayer. We hope that everyone is having a great experiences and insights from this conference. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Now we would like to have your attention because it is about time for Dr. Nico Suranta as the chairman of, two, of ICOBAR 2020 to announce the winners of best papers. To Dr. Suranta, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Rector of Bina Nusantara University, Professor Dr. Haryanto Prabowo. Honorable Vice Rector of Research and Technology Transfer, Professor Tirta Nurgerha Musitama. 
Honorable Vice Rector, Campus Director, and Dean and Director of the Faculty. Our distinguished keynote speakers for today, Associate Professor Dr. Nanta Kumar Loganathan and Her Excellency Olivia Leslie, and all the presenters of the COBAR. So, thank you so much for uh, participating in this conference. I hope you joined our conference so far. So I think this is the most awaited moments for the presenters. So this year, the committee had received uh, 338 submitted manuscripts from eight countries. So through double blind peer review, the committee have carefully selected 191 research paper that will be presented during the conference. So we also thanks for the, all the reviewers that was involved in the review process. So in my database is around uh, almost 100 reviewers was involved in this uh, paper reviewing process. So from the 191 accepted papers, the committee also carefully selected the four paper to receive the best paper awards. The best paper is selected based on the quality of the paper and the appropriateness to the conference theme and scope. So here I will announce the four best paper awards. The winner will receive a certificate and some voucher provided by committee. So this is the most awaited moment. So the best paper awards of IPOPAR 2020 goes to, so the first one is, uh, congratulations to Andi uh, Ramadan, Haris Wirawan, Fajri Aputra, and Dr. Fergianto Egunawan with the paper Logistic Network Optimization Using Balance Allocation Multi-Depot Vehicle Routing Problem. So this is uh, to receive the best paper awards. This is the first paper that received the best paper awards. So the order here doesn't indicate the order of the winner. So all receive the same certificate best paper award. So the second one is, okay, congratulations to Maria S. Astriani, Raymond Bahana, Andres Kurniawan, and Lee Hui Yi for the paper entitled Low Power Consumption for Detection Using Three Features. And then the next one is, okay, congratulations to Muhammad Hamsal and Muhammad Iksan for the paper entitled Business Sustainability in the Times of Crisis, Propositions and Framework. And the last one is, yeah, co congratulations to Dr. Ulani Yunus, Dr. Lea Simek, and Dr. Bernadetta P. Wahyudintias with the paper entitled Negotiating the Cultural Values in Indonesia Mixed Nationality Marriage Toward Society 5.0. So congratulations for all the best paper awards uh, receiver. So I hope that it motivates the researchers to produce more better uh, research in the future. So I will return the, uh, the session to the master of ceremony. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Right. Thank you, Dr. Soranta, for the announcement, and congratulations to the winners of these papers. We really hope that th this will encourage other researchers to produce um, great researches in the future. So, Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to the most awaited session, which is the keynote speech session. The, uh, in this keynote speech session, the keynote speaker will be delivering a presentation and then will be followed by a dialogue session. The first keynote speaker is Associate Professor Dr. Nantakumar Loganathan. He is the professor, see, he is the Associate Professor in University of Technology Malaysia. He is about to present trade and economic sustainability of the Belt and Road Initiative. In this first keynote speech session, the dialogue session will be led by Dr. Miranda Tanjung as the moderator. Without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Nanta Kumar Loganathan and Dr. Miranda Tanjung as the moderator. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Vira. 
for the introduction and uh, okay good, very good morning uh, to us excellencies distinguished guests and participants uh, firstly allow me to introduce myself my name is Miranda vice chair of the ICOBER 2020 and um, the chair uh, requested me to be a moderator for this session uh, as yesterday we already had two great uh, keynote speakers Professor Trio Adiono from ITB and Mr. Jun Hirabayashi from Kunie Corporation Japan. And for this morning, we will again hear other uh, great keynote speech by two distinguished keynote speakers. The first one will be delivered by Associate Professor Dr. Nata Kumarno Loganatan. Dr. Nata Kumar Log uh, Loganatan is a uh, Associate Professor at Asman Hashim International Business School, University Technology Malaysia. He is holding a PhD on development economics. His current research uh, interests mainly focus on applied time series econometrics in development economics, tourism economics, environmental and resource economics. He has published a large number of academic articles, books, and book chapters. He is also active in numerous international conferences through his role as appointed reviewers and scientific committee for international journals. This morning, he has joined us and he will be giving his keynote speech for the ICOBAR. His speech entitled Trade and Economic Sustainability of the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, on ASEAN Maritime Route Countries with China. So I believe we will hear a great presentation from him and we will learn new things on the issues of trade and economic sustainability in the Asian region. So Dr. Natakumar, thank you so much for joining us in this event. The time is yours now. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. And good morning, uh, uh, good morning to the rector, vice rector and all the uh, deans and head of departments and all <coughs> all participants today uh thank you so much for giving me this uh, this opportunity to present part of my research uh on belt road initiative uh, among the asian country with uh, china uh shall i share this slide can i share, share the slide yes yes please okay. You can see it? Yes, clearly. Okay. Okay, this is my title. So we want to, today I, it's like a very brief, uh, you know, a very brief uh, presentation uh, looking at uh, how far does the Asian country uh, dominated by China in terms of trade and uh, how far we can go further uh, with uh, the economic progress in the Asian region with uh, China. Uh, first of all, we will look at the history first, uh, how China's global trade started. And everybody knows that China is having a very uh, competitive uh, trade with uh, US nowadays with a lot of trade wars and a lot of things. But we, we should know that uh, China attempt twice uh, to link with the Western region by basically a uh, during the Han's dynasty when China opened the, the Silk Road trade and with Central Asia and the Mediterranean region. This is the, the first attempt they are started to explore far away from their country to uh, start with trade and uh, uh, moving forward in terms of trading partners and so on. And uh, secondly, in the 50th century during the Ming dynasty, they started again with the second maritime Silk Road was formed connecting China and the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Ocean. During this period, we can see most of the Asian, Southeast Asian country involved in this, in the 50th uh, century. So we know that China has already have a long history with this uh, trade uh, since uh, of uh, the Han Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty, so that we, we realize that China is not new in terms of trade and uh, doing a trading with all the countries around the world. They are started very early using these two roads, which is the Silk Road, and another road is the, the Maritime Road. Uh, while in the 21st century reason, uh, Maritime Silk Road, uh, China <coughs> started a new trade route by using the Belt Road. So later on, I will discuss a bit how they create these two roads 
and how they are deal with all these country around the world and how they are uh, deliver and export and import all the goods and services in all the countries around the world. So now we can see that China is started long time ago. It's not a new process in terms of trade uh, with Asian countries or European countries or African countries even and uh, South Asian countries. It started far away in uh, very early during the old dynasties of uh, China. So, but today we were more focused on how these uh, roads and how these uh, uh, the, the the big uh, the main land of China is dealing with the Southeast Asia and how far the Southeast Asian can collaborate and get along with China's uh, policies in terms of trade and so on. Basically, when we look at this uh, trade route is basically this uh, China is trying to build up the infrastructure, infrastructure uh, development for most of the countries involved in this Belt Road. Actually, their main aim is connecting all the countries uh, along the Belt Road so that all products and goods and services can be easily uh, export and import within all the countries involved in this uh, uh, belt road. The main aim is the infrastructure actually. So we will look at the positive side and the negative side of this belt road later on. So we will uh, look uh, look <coughs> all these uh, uh, possibilities of uh, getting uh, connected with uh, China in the next <clears throat> slides. So we, this is the one I'm mentioning just now. You can see how big is the, you know, how big is the, uh, the what we call the connection between uh, mainland of China and the Southeast Asian country. You can see how big uh, and how far these countries can collaborate with uh, China. Uh, China proposed the idea in in 2000, I think 20 years back. Uh, leaders of Asian countries and China decided to explore more uh, integration uh, using this trade. It started 20 years ago and the first agreement was um, uh, signed during the, uh, the meeting in 2002, which is so long ago, 18 years. And uh, with six first signatures uh, who engage, 90% of their products will uh, facing these tariff issues among the Asian countries. This is the, one of the main issues when we talk about the trade war between uh, China and United States. But if we, using this uh, agreement, all these countries uh, will have some uh, uh, will have some possibility to have more uh, connection with China with a reduced tariff and they can export their products to each another. They can export and they can do integration by trading their goods and services with a lower price with China. And everybody knows that China is well known for uh, this what we call the uh, dumping products. Everybody is everybody knows, but the United States is dealing with all the countries in the world to avoid these dumping issues. Dumping means uh, that you know, the Chinese are producing goods and uh, sell it outside of China with a lower price. And then this will affect most of the developed countries who produce the same goods and services. And uh, the price uh, war appear because of this dumping. Dumping is the what we call the main anti-dumping act is created by the United States. And everybody knows that dumping is the main issues when we talk about trading and trading partners, uh, integration and so on. So China is trying to get close with all the Asian countries and all the uh, countries along the Belt Road so that they can survive, they can uh, sell their products, they can buy the products from their other countries and then can survive and they then they can compete with most of the con developed countries in the world. So that is the main aim why this, uh, this big country is doing a belt route uh, with Asian countries. Uh, China has transformed during the uh, 21st century. They opened their doors, they allowed all the investors to invest in their country. They are also going to outside, they are going to outside and they are invest a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, infrastructure related uh, uh, projects and so on. And uh, they are also uh, increase the foreign investment in the bamboo network. They are doing some network each and other. Each country is involving a network of overseas Chinese businesses operating in the market, mainly in Southeast Asian country 
and common family and cultural ties is one of the main reasons they are very close with us. So basically, when we talk about China, everybody thought that China is facing a big war with the United States. That is a war because of the dumping issues and because of the tariff. While in the other part, in the other part of the world, China is creating more integration and trade with all small and big countries in the region, in the Southeast Asian region and the uh, African region as well and South Asian countries as well, like Pakistan and so on. And they are building up a lot of infrastructure to connecting all the countries with China. So we will look at the map later on and you might be get surprised with what they are actually doing. They are, they are creating a very big empire so that they can survive and sustain competing with the United States. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, the market of Southeast Asian country is very big. The market with 2 billion of people and uh, with uh, 452 billion in 2016 and is expected with 1 trillion uh, with um, trading by this year, 2020. And 90% of Asians uh, export to China are tariff free. So you see, when they are having war with the United States in terms of tariff and dumping and so on, in other parts of the world, China is giving more opportunity and more chances for small countries and uh, networking countries to avoid all these tariff. And they are getting a very big market in the Asian region. So actually, they are doing a very good integration with Asian country. And we also having a very uh, good and um, uh, sustainable uh, linkages with all the companies and investors uh, from China. So you can see here this slide, uh, it's giving a trade free for most of the product. It mean, that means that uh, when the invest investors or producers from Indonesia or Malaysia is producing something, and let's say they want to export the product to China, the mainland, there was no tax or tariff will be imposed. That means the product will be very cheap and the product from China also which coming to our country Nowadays, we are having Shopee, we are having Lazada, all these things. Even we don't have any digital tax on that goods and services. So it will be reach our home easily without any tariff, very cheap price. And we are very happy collaborating with China and all the Asian region uh, in terms of trade and integrating the trade uh, for the long period. In other way around, when we look at United States, they are, they are looking at China and they are looking at the way they are doing the trade policy and looking at the way that China is collaborating with other countries, make them like they are feeling a bit scared and they are, they are thought that China is monopoly and they are, will control all the region and so on. For me, it looks like China is having a very good uh, relationship in terms of trade. It's not saying that China is doing dumping and they are monopoly all the countries in the Asian region. It's not like that. It shows that they are giving opportunity for the local companies and local producers to join together uh, in terms of trade and expose their product uh, worldwide. This is good uh, for uh, Asian countries uh, who face some limitation in terms of getting uh, market, big markets. So uh, we can see here, we have 10 Asian countries. Asian total uh, trade with China reaches around uh, 346 billion, which is 15% is coming from Asian trade. So you see it's how big is the trade connection with uh, China. And of course, China is looking forward to collaborate with all of the Asian 10 Asian countries. They have a good collaboration with all these 10 Asian countries. Uh, and also there was issues related to World Trade Organization uh, in terms of uh, dumping and the tax uh, tariff uh, worldwide, and uh, we expect that uh, the expansion of bilateral trade, bilateral means the two-way trade between Malay, uh, Malaysia and China, or China with Malaysia, or Indonesia with uh, China, or other way around. So we will have a very good bilateral trade, uh, mainly on oil and gases, uh, food, uh, natural resources, uh, clothing, electric and electronic. Of course, the tourism industry is getting uh, a very good progress nowadays. And then the educational services, we can see most of the Chinese students are coming to South Asian countries to have some uh, Southeast, Asian, Southeast Asian language studies and so on. It shows that uh, the Chinese mainland is having a very good uh, uh, perspective and uh, uh, collaboration with this uh, Asian, Asian country. And uh, recently we faced the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and uh, all this trade and all these uh, 
linkages has stopped for a while, one or two months, and we, it will be uh, started again with a very good progress soon. And you see, we are more depending on China's good. Even during the COVID, we are looking at Chinese uh, products and uh, services, and we can't get it. And we are we don't have any other alternative sources to get the goods because uh, other goods or other part of world, if you want to purchase something, it is very expensive because they are having tariff. While we are purchasing something directly from China using Shopee or Lazada or anything, we we can realize that the product is cheap, and. Uh, in terms of quality and um, you know the performance of the goods, it looks like it's acceptable uh, compared to the products coming from far away from Japan or far away from United States or UK. So it shows that we need uh, we need this big dragon to collaborate with uh, us in the Asian region, even though we are not a very big block in terms of trade in the world. But we are having a very good connection with uh, one of the biggest country in the world, which is China. And at the same time, we also noted that uh, the Asian and China in the third country market as outcome of World Trade Organizations uh, with China. I mean, uh, the World Trade Organization categorized uh, the Southeast Asian is the most progressive and um, performing region. Uh, and uh, China also knows about that. And uh, with a huge numbers of population and a huge numbers of demand we are facing in the region, uh, definitely we can have a very good trade partnership with uh, China later on. So this is my opinion in terms of trade uh, between China and the Southeast Asian country. Even though some say it's like, uh, oh, dealing with China is, uh, is a very dangerous and very risky because they will face a very big problem with the United States. But in other way around, I think that is a very good way uh, to have this connection with China. Actually, we uh, the Asian country already started uh, to uh, collaborate and having a very good uh, uh, trade partners with China based on the Asian China Free Trade Area or ACFTA. So this started early and all, all the Asian countries having some meetings regularly discussing about how we can establish the, the connection and integration and trade with uh, China. And most of the time, Asian top export to China, of course, equipment, computers, machinery, uh, fuels, all organic chemicals, we are exporting to them. And also China, uh, economic uh, progressing very well when they're having this connection, ACFTA, and uh, <clears throat> will create more region with 1.7 billion consumers. As I said just now, we have almost 200 billion consumers in this region. And uh, even we are supplying half of the uh, products to half of the population in the region, we might be, uh, uh, we might dominate uh, in terms of trade. So this uh, FT, uh, ACFTA, it will enlarge the size of the market and enhance the trade. So it will contribute to the trade, not only for China, but it will also contribute for the nations in the Southeast Asian country. And later on, I will show you how uh, Saudi Asian countries uh, uh, exporting goods to China and uh, how far they can progress their growth because having a good uh, relationship with uh, China. Number two, uh, these uh, countries also uh, having a very Good, uh, you know, there was no barriers of uh, trade. Okay, no barriers of trade when we are dealing with China and uh, enhance economic efficiency. That is the main thing we will talk about when we are talking uh, when we discussing about economy <coughs> and the uh, efficiency. So the key features of trade with non-tariff barriers. Okay, fine, we can have a very good trade partners in the Asian region, even in the Asian region itself. Uh, we are having this uh, Asian to uh, Asian countries also having this type of uh, rules and regulation in terms of trade. But we are dealing with a very big country, so we will remove all the barriers. We will make sure that uh, the efficiency of the economy appeared, and the trade will be moving on efficient efficiently uh, for the long term period. A low cost import, which I say just now, no tariff under the FTA flow from one member to other member, like say from China to Malaysia, to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to in, from Indonesia to maybe to Philippines, all of these countries will have some inflows and outflows of goods and products without 
uh, any barriers and without with a very efficiency of product and trade movement in the region so the third one will be uh, improve investment pro perspective so the formation of asian uh, china investment area should be also generating the investment movement that means the foreign direct investments are coming to most of the countries in southeast asia from china you can see for example in malaysia the the, the chinese government uh, <clears throat> want to build you know the railway track from singapore to kuala lumpur from kuala lumpur to going to east coast and then they are going up to bangkok that means the goods let's say we want to have a mass uh, a movement of goods from china it can simply uh, uh, use this track from china is going to thailand and is going to malaysia and is going to singapore and then it will transfer to indonesia and it can go to australia on all, all these things will be happen because for china for this big country the infrastructure is the main reason they are want to build up a belt road it's not because of they want to create a you know a new environment but they want to create a network that means easily the movement based on the infrastructure even the chinese uh, china's market potential is already well established we know very well they have a very good potential in term of uh, investment most of the companies are coming here and uh, they are doing investments and uh, i think uh, most of the uh, southeast asian countries already receive uh, mask uh, yeah, investment prospectus uh, recently, last 10 years, a lot of companies from China is coming here. Even in uh, Vietnam also, they are establishing a uh, route uh, from China directly to Vietnam to uh, export and import goods from both countries. And uh, we, this is the one I'm, I, I want to show you. Uh, we can see here all the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, eight countries. Uh, <clears throat> this is from one of the a figure I received from the Chinese website, uh, the Chinese Economy Progress website. You can see the, the country who have a lot of investment and collaboration and uh, uh, trading partner is number one is Malaysia and followed by uh, Thailand and Indonesia. And later we have here Philippines and then we have Brunei, Cambodia and Myanmar. Why Malaysia is having a very good partnership with China? Because the Malaysian government has opened a very big area in the west coast, east coast of Malaysia for Chinese investors to come and do investment, mainly on textiles, uh, technological related uh, investment. And most of the uh, Chinese companies are coming to Malaysia. They are doing investment. They are producing a lot of goods and services. Even the national car of Malaysia, the Proton, also having a very good connection with the Gili the, the manufacturer from uh, China, the Gili is the one who bought the Volvo and the, the, the UK taxi, the London taxi. Uh, the both uh, companies uh, is now under Gili. So this uh, uh, manufacturer from uh, China is already uh, took some percentage of the uh, productions of uh, Proton in Malaysia. I mean, 49, 51% is belongs to Malaysian uh, uh, investors and 49% is uh, belongs to China. That means the Chinese are bringing uh, and built up, bringing the technology to Malaysia and they have built up the car. And the car will be, of course, will be Gili, uh, represent their brand, but they are, will help to, uh, imp, uh, they will help the local assembly like Proton to increase the production based on the Gili technology. Gili is the Volvo, you know, the Volvo is belongs to Gili. So they are having a good connection with the national car from Malaysia. And the next followed by Thailand, of course, they are having a very good relationship with China. And then we have Indonesia and all these members having a very a positive trade with China. There was no, it's, it's keep on increasing and increasing and increasing, but um, uh, the China is looking at more investment in Southeast Asian countries. And uh, Asian, this is very surprisingly asian overtake overtake the EU, eu's uh, top trading partners in recent data 2020 first quarter the this region we went with 10 countries we took over the eu 
connection with top trading partners. Now we are leading in terms of uh, trading partners, not in terms of volume, but in terms of trading partners that, of course, is from China. So compared to Euro, which have a lot of countries with 511 million of people, but you see Asian country with a huge 631 million of people, we can overtake uh, EU become the China's top trading partner. Now we are having, we are the number one uh, trading partner with China, no longer EU, because we have a huge numbers of population here and the demand is here and all products are coming here with a very cheap price. But uh, of course, reason uh, post pandemic economic uh, and all these pandemic issues uh, reduce and um, the, the progress of trade is getting lesser and lesser. In during the second quarter, we might face this problem, but this is globally, everybody is facing this problem, not a big issue. So this is a very, this is the latest uh, figure uh, we can see with uh, only with 10 countries compared to 28 countries from EU, we are, uh, top trading partner, uh, the region is the top trading partner, trading partner with China is not uh, EU. So you now we can realize why China is more focusing on Southeast Asian country compared to EU and other region because of the population, the demand is there. Okay, that's why they want to build up the very comprehensive and very uh, effective, uh, efficient infrastructure connecting all these countries so that they can trade and doing trading uh, easily, efficiently, efficiently and uh, consistently for future uh, progress. So this is the country. Uh, we have a lot of countries involving with the trade road. So this we, we can see here, the Belt Road, the main contributor is Europe and then Africa, Middle East and Asia and nations with higher population of course asia is 65 percent of the trading is from coming from asian country <coughs> and we can see here numbers of countries which have the uh, belt road connection with china all these countries will have some reflection by uh, when the chinese government imposed the belt road so everybody will have some trading issues they won't have any tax they can easily trade each another and this is one of the reason why the United States is getting, you know, is giving a lot of uh, 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 troubles and always uh, mentioning China is creating a war and every uh, and uh, some sort like that. But when we look at how China is doing the trading with all these countries, it's quite interesting. They are having a very good connection, even not in Asia, but they are having in Africa, East Asia, Central Asia, Middle Asia, South Asia, and of course, uh, in Europe. So it shows that the capability of this uh, China is really is surprising, surprisingly, surprisingly will overtake most of the region with a very good trade uh, partnership in the long term. I think this is might be very, in, I think within 20 years or 30 years, uh, the China, this Belt Road will be very dominant in terms of trading and uh, uh, economic progress. <coughs> okay, while this one, uh, this graph shows that uh, how the economic progress uh, within the Asian countries, of course, Indonesia having a very high GDP because it is a very big country. This is one of the reason uh, Indonesia having a very high GDP and followed by Malaysia and then followed by Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia, Cambodia, Brunei and Vietnam and Thailand. So this is the GDP progress. This is not showing the, the economic growth. This is just uh, annually uh, GDP progress. I mean growth and uh, <clears throat> economic uh, uh, gross domestic product. This is not showing any growth. Okay, each and every country having their own growth uh, scales, that means uh, percentage of growth. But this one shows that the progress of the GDPs each year. So from 2010 until 2020, uh, still Indonesia is dominating and it's number one in terms of GDP. But in terms of growth, of course, we can see Singapore and uh, we can see Thailand is moving very fast. So this is GDP. Okay, we can see here all these countries having a very good GDP progress. For China, they love this type of progress. They love this type of progress so that they can invest 
they can, can deliver their product, they can having a very good trade partners and so on. This is why they are loving this region compared to other regions because all, all countries, all 10 countries in the Southeast Asian countries is progressing very well. The no countries is falling down or having a very a decrease or falling in terms of GDP. All countries are performing very well, even though with a small numbers of percentage increase over year. So it shows that each and every country have a very high potential when China, the mainland China is doing investment in this country. And um, the, we will start with the Belt Road now. So we will look, uh, uh, just now I show you how far China is progressing and how far China is dominating and how far China is having a very good connection with Asian country. Now we will look at this Belt Road. What is actually this Belt Road means? Some of you all might know about this Belt Road and some of you all may, you don't know what is actually Belt Road and why we need this Belt Road. Actually, in, this started in 2012 when, uh, when one of the professors in China, he mentioned about uh, the Chinese uh, to dominate the routes, the maritime routes and the Silk Road. He's the one who mentioned in the early stage. the uh, three Silk Road to Southeast Asia, there's a, tree, uh, there's a road, uh, using the maritime and there is a road up there using the silk road and in the early stage we call it as a one belt one road that mean there was a one road coming from china is going to the maritime going to southeast asia and it will turn around going to india is turn around going to africa it is one road one belt one road is created by china that means all countries along this belt road will be having these tariff issues and they will have some uh, opportunity and uh, chances to having trade with China. So all the countries along this road is agreed to collaborate with China and having a very good trade partner with China. And it shows that the road is going far away from China and now it goes to Africa. I will show you the map uh, after this. Of course, in the early stage, this product built uh, based on the based on the western people who uh, who dominate this road in the early stage like marco polo uh, batututa and uh, zanki in the early stage in the those days they're having this road but they don't have a proper well designed road like china which we are facing now those days they're having this marco polo road from coming from european region coming to asian region and then they're having some road to china but that is not properly arranged with the, all the countries along the road but nowadays, the China is preparing a very comprehensive road and all the countries along the road will face some uh, issues with trade and China will come uh, with some rules and regulation with tariff, uh, no tariff, and you can uh, sell your product along the road with all the countries without any tariff. That means all the product coming from Indonesia, Malaysia will be cheap outside and with a huge population in the region we might face a very good trade and very good economic progress in the long term. Now you can see how the China is dominating the world. So you can see up here, the red line is the Silk Road, the old Silk Road which, which connect between China going far away to Russia, Kazakhstan, and it's going far away until to Rotterdam in, uh, in, the Europe, in, in Europe. Of course, in Moscow also, they are having this road. And then it will come back again and we assume that it will be joined with this blue line. You look at the blue line, it's quite surprisingly from China is moving far away, coming to Singapore and uh, Malacca Street down here and it's go to Sri Lanka. And then of course they are will having some trade with India and it go far away with to Kenya and they are go inside here to Africa, North Africa, ECOWAS countries and then it go to Greece and finally it will uh, join together with another road coming from the, the, from the Silk Road and uh, it will merge in Europe. So now you can see how big is the trading partner for China in terms of the road. It's very big. But if, when you look at the United States, they don't have this road, but they are, they are having other way around. So we can see here, China is, a, is creating a very big trade empire. You can see very big. When we combine these two lines, you can see how big is the road. So then all the countries along the road will have some tariff issues and they will face a very good trade partnership with all the countries and bilateral trade will be increased in the long term. Even though this road is new for some 
countries. But, um, and some says that China will monopoly, China will be controlled, China will be do that and do that. And in terms of economy, that is another side. But in terms of progressing the economy by selling our goods outside market, it's very easy using this road. So now you can see how big is the road. It's not where it's China is not dealing from the mainland to other country, it's dealing along the road. And I think this is very big. I think it's very big with a huge population. This is very big. Okay. And, and now we will look at some of the infrastructure they are built up. When we look at the, uh, you see on your right hand side, there was a colorful line, everything. They already built up this infrastructure. They already have the track, the train lanes, and they already have a lot of uh, uh, connectivity in terms of uh, infrastructure. First of all, new Eurasian land, land bridge, they already built up. And China, Mongolia, Russia corridor, they have built up a corridor in the northern part and China, Central Asia and West, West Asian corridor, they are built as well. China, Indochina Peninsula corridor uh, near the Cambodia, Vietnam and all these things, they have built a new corridor there. And also in the South Asian country, they are having a good relationship with Pakistan, China, Pakistan economic corridor, they have built up a very new corridor down there to get a very uh, high demand and with a high population from South Asian countries, mainly from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, they can sold their product there and then they can get some product from China, from Pakistan, India as well. So you see, they have already started with the corridors now. So later on, all these corridors are in line and relate to this Belt Road. And soon after 50 years or 100 years, we might see a very comprehensive, a very big empire, trade empire by this Belt Road. So all this uh, built up. But in term, in when we're talking about Southeast Asian country, there was no roadmap, uh, new roadmap uh, discussed so far. But uh, China will come out, I think, a very good corridor for uh, Southeast Asian countries. So far, we don't have any uh, corridors uh, represent the Chinese investors or China with uh, local uh, Southeast Asian countries. So we are only have the Belt Road without any corridors. We might have a corridors uh, soon. We might have, maybe we might have a corridor between Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore with China or some, some sort like that. Uh, I don't know, but uh, we, there might be the corridor soon in the, in the Southeast Asian region. So you see, all are well planned, all because of infrastructure. The Chinese people know very well, without infrastructure, they cannot do anything. They need the infrastructure. When we look at the infrastructure, it's coming far away from China. It can easily come to Thailand and it will go down a little bit to Malaysia and it will go down a little bit to China, Singapore and the product can be easily distributed to Indonesia. Even we can have a very good trade with Australia later on in the long term period. So it's a very easy process from China. And um, this is China market makes up US trade war deficit by buying from Asia. So recently, everybody's talking about trade uh, war between China and um, uh, United States. Everybody's saying that China is selling uh, cheap, cheap products and services outside from China, which is dumping. And United States come up with anti-dumping act. And nobody's agree about the anti-dumping act because everybody needs goods which is cheap and it is, which is coming from China. So what happened is when the United States saying that, okay, we are having war with China, but in other way around, the China, the, the big land, the mainland is uh, facing a very good uh, condition in terms of trade with Southeast Asian country, even though there was a war, but this China still can survive and still can produce and still can sell and uh, having a good trade with their partners, mainly Southeast Asian country because Southeast Asian country have almost 2 billion of people. I mean, very huge population. So when there was a trade war, you see in 2018, in the middle of 2018, everything goes down and flopped. But suddenly the, the Chinese market pick up very fast because they're having trading with Asian country, not from other region. They're having a very good relationship with Asian country. If the Asian country is not contributing or not having a good relationship with China, might China might having a very big problem with the trade war. So for the time being, they are not having a very big trade war with United States, 
we have already have a demand from the Southeast Asian country. Every each and every product produced in China, it will be sold in Saudi in Southeast Asian country. Each and every goods and services from Southeast Asian country easily we can export and import with China without any trade uh, tax or we call it as a tariff. So that the product will be cheap in this region and everybody can purchase the uh, goods and services easily. So this is one of the reasons. Uh, recently, uh, there were some newspapers asking me about uh, what do you think about Chinese and this United States trade war? Do you think the Chinese can survive during this pandemic and during this uh, trade war? I say, yes, of course. Yeah, when we are picking up, we, when we pick up, uh, uh, picking up from the uh, COVID later on within six months or three months after this, uh, China will be progressing very well as we are progressing, they are also progressing. When China is facing some problem, we are also facing a problem. That is one of the limitations. When China is facing a very big uh, pandemic, all the Southeast Asian also is suffering because there was no trade. That is only one reason we might say that China is dominating the Southeast Asia. But when is, everything is recovered, uh, I think that uh, everything will be smoothly progressed and uh, we might have a very good trade partner with uh, China. Okay, this is a U.S. trade war uh, because of the Belt Road as well. Uh, I don't know who win the war. For everybody asking who win the war, some say that United States win the war. Some say it's like the China, the Chinese are winning the war. When we talk about this trade and uh, proposed tariff and all these things, it looks like the United States are putting a lot of tariff on Chinese products. And while Chinese is not putting a lot of tariff on U.S. product, but they are sold the product outside from China to other region, which have a huge demand. While United States is trying to protect the local and domestic goods and services, and while they are putting tax on outside product, which getting inside United States, and they are getting money from the tariff, but China is not doing like that. Chinese is import from United States; they are still import 130 millions and so on billions. While proposed tariff by the 60% and tariff applied so far in 2018 around 50. So it shows that China is not afraid with United States. They are not afraid because of the war. They only have their own strength. They only have their friendship with Southeast Asian country. They have a very good friendship with Asian countries. It shows that the United States are putting tariff more and more to protect and to ensure that the Chinese product won't enter the United States. It looks like from my point of view, it's looking looks like uh, there was a huge increase in Chinese buying worldwide and Chinese is surviving in the world uh, without focusing on the war. They are not actually uh, doing any war. They are doing as usual, not doing any war. They can survive since we are supporting the Chinese uh, trade and policies agreement. And uh, this one benefit from the, uh, the initiative, the Belt Road. We can see 4.6 billion combined population all around the uh, Belt Road Initiative BRI. We have around 4.6 billion all together and 61% uh, of the world's population is from the BRI. You see how big uh, the Chinese government built up the BRI? 60% is not half, half, half of the world's population, it's almost 60%. That means 60% of the world population is dominated and is inside the uh, Belt Road. And 229 trillion combined GDP of all countries, I mean, very big, 21 trillion, all countries' GDP when we combine is 29 billion, trillion. Trade between China and BRI countries in, during uh, three years, early stage in 2014 and until 2017, around 6 trillion. That means they are progressing very well. This is why United States, uh, you know, they are creating some issues about trade war because they are looking at China is doing a very good progressing and uh, trade partners and they are progressing very well. And estimated cost of infrastructure is estimated around 26 uh, trillion. They are building up very huge and mass uh, infrastructure production. And um, China also is spending a lot on this infrastructure with their technologies, with their expertise, they are building up the infrastructure nowadays. And, um, of course, the, uh, the, this BRI presents risk commonly because of uh, transparency, uh, openness of trade. This might be a little bit risk. Uh, or for example, the pandemic is risk. When anything happened to China, okay, the Belt Road will be facing some problem. 
if anything happened to Southeast Asian country, of course, the Belt Road will be a little bit problem because it's stated, it's located in the middle of the Belt Road. If anything happened in the region, any, any uh, political issues or any disasters happening during along the Belt Road, oh yes, they will face a problem. That is the limitation. So there, therefore, this China is building up infrastructure, the alternative way to send their goods and so on. You can see the train, the first uh, train from China to UK in 2017. It shows that they are more focusing on the infrastructure rather than looking at other things. They want to build up uh, infrastructure. Those days when you look at the old empires like uh, the, the old empires like in Europe, like in uh, Zul uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asian country or uh, in the Asian region, they are not building up any empires using transportation. That's the main reason some of the empire cannot last long. But this empire is like a trade empire built up by the Chinese, is more on infrastructure. Infrastructure is the main reason for this belt road. They can easily move around within the region. They can easily send their goods and products, services and everything within the region without any problem. Okay. Um, this is another trap we might face. This is a limitation from my point of view. Um, there was limitation. Everybody saying that this is a very big dragon. Anytime this dragon can be aggressive and anytime this dragon will be more, you know, if, if, if the dragon getting angry or the dragon is aggressive, we might face the problem uh, all the country, small countries along the Belt Road. For example, uh, recently the Malaysian government cancelled out some of the infrastructure project uh, related to uh, China. Some of the project like uh, railway track between uh, the East Coast and the West Coast and going to northern part of <clears throat> Malaysia and uh, Thailand, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, there was a mass infrastructure development, rail, train, speed train, rail, which also cancel and they are now they are getting start again. Uh, that is one of the problem. Uh, Turkey's keep um, the forum citing about this, uh, uh, what we call the debt trap diplomacy recently also. They are scared about the debt. And of course, Turkey is facing a lot of problem in terms of uh, progressing the economic recently. They are facing economic problem. They're facing, facing a very huge inflation. And uh, Montenegro, BRI, uh, Belt Road Initiative Financing has drastically expanded their national debt. Some countries facing this problem, even Sri Lanka also facing this problem. And the airport also has been sold out to, I think sold out to one of the investors from uh, China. In Kenya also, in African country also, they have a limited uh, resources of uh, uh, investments, uh, foreign investment and domestic investment. And these are the limitation debt trap might have within the country. If the Chinese government facing some problem, all the countries along the Belt Road will might facing a problem as well. And if the Chinese is progressing very well, all the countries might progressing very well because there was no tariff uh, for goods and services uh, we are exporting to another region. So um, today, I think uh, this is all I wish already shared with you. But as a conclusion, I might say that this corridor, this belt road might be a very successful uh, story in the new millennium. I think in the 20, 30 years from now, uh, maybe we were already getting old. We might see this belt road is mono, um, will be monopoly, will be a very big empire, and we might facing a very uh, cha big changes in terms of trade and uh, getting products and getting services from other country within the uh, region. Okay, that's all for from my side today. A very um, uh, what we call a very brief uh, talk today. Not a very uh, complicated or very empirically or using very statistic uh, slide. It's a very brief uh, uh, explanation from my side today. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Kumar. Yeah. Uh, insightful. I enjoy your presentation. I learned many things, especially mm -hmm. the BRR. I know uh, I heard about the Belt Road, but uh, uh, I think this morning session is amazing. So uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna give like a summary for what we already heard uh, this morning. First, we learn uh, the history of China, global trade from the Asian time to present days. And then second, we also have heard that uh, ASEAN-China trade agreement is a uh, 
mutual as it benefiting both markets and it is growing year by year now. Uh, the third, the AAC FTA is the biggest FTA in the world in terms of population. Fourth, the uh, Asian countries trade rank with China. First is Malaysia, uh, second Thailand, three, uh, three Indonesia, fourth uh, Philippines, and the numbers is uh, growing. Uh, five, ASEAN overtake uh, European Union to become China top trading partner in the first quarter uh, this year. And we also have uh, learned that there are some risks and also limitation from the BRI. So I'm for the uh, next session, we will start the Q&A. And then the first, I'm gonna read the first question from uh, Mr. Andreas. Uh, the question is, how can we use the Chinese uh, Silk Road to improve the economy? And then uh, question number two, uh, from Ika Nur Laila, um, we are aware of Indonesia is a, a huge nation with archipelagic architecture uh, where each area has its own unique in terms of natural resources that could be the mainstay, mainstay of their living. Uh, all nations acknowledge that. What would be your thoughts on why Indonesia hasn't been seen as powerful trading country that sell manufactured goods rather than exporting uh, raw materials. So I'm gonna uh, read these two questions and then waiting for your answer, Dr. Natakumar. Okay, well, the first question is what regarding the Silk Road, am I correct? Yes, yes. What can, uh, how can we use the China Silk Road to improve the economy, maybe uh, for Indonesia perspective? Okay, Silk Road, uh, for, for me, Silk Road is far away from the Southeast Asian countries, very far away. It's connecting China and the European from the northern part, which is from, uh, China going to Kazakhstan, Russia, and it's going to Europe. It's far away. We are for when we look at the slides, uh, the one I show you, uh, we are far away. We are most of the Asian country and Southeast Asian country are more focusing on the Belt Road, the road, the maritime road. It's far away. It's connecting each another. That's why they are building the road. The the transportation from the side with Asia is going up, is going to the Belt Road, but it's far away from our country, our Asian country. Is very far away. They already have their own agenda in the northern uh, part, in the in the Russia, Kazakhstan, all these uh, uh, <coughs> Soviet Union countries of those days. So they already have their own agenda. We are far away, unless we are having a uh, very good trading uh, trading uh, with China and they are distributing our goods to those those countries. I mean, let's say the goods are coming from uh, China, Indonesia very mass production, something good, and we, we do trade with China, and China will trade, and they will trade to other countries in the northern part of the world. I mean, in the, near the Russia, Kazakhstan, and so on. Nowadays, the, the two roads are connecting uh, together in Europe. It's not connecting in uh, the middle of the road. It's, there was no connection at all. These both are going up, and another one is going to the maritime, and finally, they will meet up in the uh, European region, unless we are sending or we are having a very good trade partners from Europe. I think uh, it's a little bit hard from my point of view. Okay. Okay, the third uh, question is, uh, dear Dr. Natakumar, your speech is intriguing. Uh, this is from uh, Ms. Ika Nur Laila. Um, your speech is intriguing, knowing all this trade power in Asia to be particular. Well, as we are aware of, Indonesia is such a Huge nation with, uh, sorry. Do you think uh, China strategic with Asian will be stronger after this pandemic and uh, with gloomy economic growth assumption uh, released by the World Bank and other institution, what is your uh, view oh, the, on this oh, issue? Okay, after the pandemic. Am I correct? Yes, after, after the pandemic. pandemic. Okay, after the pandemic, um, uh, we are now, we are stopped. Everything is stopped. It's like uh, the lockdown period. Even the trade also facing a lockdown period. Nobody can uh, going out. Nobody can getting inside the country. Even the tourists also is uh, not uh, traveling nowadays. I think uh, for China, they are already 
Jerry knows very well that Southeast Asian countries have a huge population, huge population with huge demand. You know, with 10 countries, we are having much more population compared to 28 or 25 countries from European region. We have a more powerful demand in Southeast Asian countries. And we have our own production from Indonesia, very big country with a huge population. They have their own demand, domestic demand, and also they're exporting their goods. Like Singapore is a very small country, but the country is entry port country. I mean, it's having a very good port connecting East and West. So the Chinese already know very well, they are will, uh, after the pandemic, they will come back again with a very good policies and where they are able, having a very good collaboration with uh, Southeast Asian countries. Because all because of the, uh, the population is very high, huge population, huge demand, uh, very near, and the infrastructure is very good, good uh, stable political condition here. All the countries are progressing very well. And, and the European countries are facing a little bit problem with currencies and all these economic issues. While in Asian country, everybody is moving forward and forward and moving very fast, especially like uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam. Of course, Vietnam is progressing very well nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it, there's no issues about pandemic after this. I think every, everything will be smoothly arranged and it will be moved smoothly, I think. Okay, so you are very positive. Mm -hmm. with your view okay okay the next question from uh, mr muhammad nanang suprayogi uh, dr natakumar currently in indonesia raising issue about the domination of china it seems that china will take over bit by bit the economic strength in indonesia and many many countries so uh, do you think is it safe to continue the collaboration with china mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. A very sensitive question. This is a little yes, bit I sensitive. Know. <laughs> I know it's a sensitive question. A little bit sensitive question. Okay, I will give some example from some countries' experience. I think Indonesia is not facing a very big problem for the time being, I think, in terms of yeah. uh, getting the asset from the country. Uh, in Sri Lanka, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Chinese investors already pick up the, uh, the airport. They already invest, they build up the airport. In Kenya also, they have built up something and they are taking over the assets. And even in Malaysia also, they are already taking over 49% of the proton uh, no, 49%. shares. 49%. Oh, okay. Yes, you know, 49% is belongs to Gili nowadays. Only 51% is be belongs to Malaysian government. And what they have done is they are bringing up their companies to Malaysia. The Gili, the one on um, the Volvo market, they already bought the Volvo. Now they're trying to get this proton and 49% is belongs to proton uh, for, for China and 51 shares is percentage of shares is belong to Malaysia. You see, when we talk about these sensitive issues, it's all depend with the government. If the government looks like uh, depending more on China and they will facing a lot of problems, then maybe we will, we will sell out our national assets. It's all depend on the countries, uh, you know, the who, who are dealing who, any country dealing with China, they must have their own uh, policies and which is not selling their asset to China. If you want to sell the asset or monop or allow all the country, all firms from China to monopoly all the local mm -hmm. firms, uh, then we, we might face the problem. It's a little bit sensitive. It depends on the country and the politician as well. If they want to let China to monopoly all the big companies in, let's say, in Indonesia, then it will be a very big issue for Indonesia because later on, all the shares will belong to foreigner, which is China. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. all depend on the political issues. Some countries depending more on China. Some countries little bit scared because it is a very big dragon. We are very small cat. It's a dragon. Anytime it will get angry. Anytime oh. it will be very aggressive. I hope. Anytime not. it will be good for us, and sometimes it will be bad for us. It's depend on the the policies from that side. Or most of the time will be investment with a careful decision uh, okay. if Indonesia want to have a very good collaboration and they knows that china having a very good partnership with the firms we must be very careful when we are dealing with uh, the shares the ownership everything must mm -hmm. be very careful if not when the when the when when the uh, dragon getting angry or the dragon getting uh, you know uh, want to having something urgently, they will do something and we will be affected. Okay. It's, all, it's a sensitive issue, uh, Miranda. Yes. It's a little yeah. bit um, it's the yeah. policies. Yeah. But so for me, uh, it's better for Indonesia or any other country in the world. Uh, must be very careful 
uh, getting friend with this big dragon. It's a very oh. big dragon. Okay. I think might be Indonesia might be a tiger, but Singapore or in Malaysia is like a small, a small cat, very very small cat. That is a dragon. So we must be very careful. Okay. <coughs> uh, next question from Mr. Uh, Dr. Hari Sutanto. I have also a similar question with uh, Mr. Muhammad Anang Suprayabeda, previous question. Since there is a lot of negative aspects of China domination and also the concerning of post-globalization after the pandemic COVID-19, is the China strategy will be the best for the world afterward? This is China against the world, uh, Doctor Nanta Kumar. Okay. We, uh, I think this question is related to the dumping issues uh, worldwide. I okay. think uh, uh, worldwide is talking about anti-dumping act. Uh, put it in our simple way. If you want to purchase something easily, cheap, and very fast receiving the good, are you going to buy product from Europe or you want to buy from Australia? You want to buy from United States? Are you willing to spend a lot of money to buy a Nike shoe from United States? No, we cannot buy a Nike shoe or Nike track shoe even, even a t-shirt from United States from the Nike brand. But the brand is belong to United States. But yes. the production is coming from China. We can afford, you, you know, we can buy the product from China. Even when you look at your Apple laptop, it's not made from United States, it's made from China. The brand is from United States, but the, the product, the production is mass production is from China. If you want to buy something from directly from, from United States, you must spend around 200 to 400 USD or 100 USD to buy a small t-shirt. But you can buy the same quality, almost same quality, maybe 99% same quality, same brand, same uh, features and everything from China. So the global market is depending on China. Nobody agree with the dumping act. Everybody is against the dumping act because we cannot buy medicine, especially the medicines in the global market. Medicine is very expensive. Medicine tools, medicine equipment you want to buy from the United States. No, they are putting a lot of tax for outside product. Even they are putting a higher price from their product. We will purchase with a higher price. It's better the world is looking at China some looking at China with the quality of the product is a very bad quality with a cheap price. Some looking at Chinese product, very good product with a very, we can afford to buy the product. It's a two way uh, mindset. If you look at when you say Chinese product, your mindset, some people's mindset will go to low quality product. Some people's mindset will go, oh, this is a dumping product. Dumping means the same good and uh, uh, services coming from China with a lesser price because Chinese want to sell a cheap price outside from China, while inside the China, they're selling a very high price. If you go to China, you can see the same product with a higher price. When you go outside, when you come to Indonesia or Malaysia, you can see the same product made in China. Even the Chinese people from mainland are buying the same product in Malaysia and Indonesia. Why they never buy in their country? Because there's a dumping issues. China's love to sold out their product outside with a cheaper price. <coughs> and the world is, of course, everybody is saying that, oh, Chinese product will destroy our local assembled product. Okay, local, who knows, one day bakso also is coming from China. Who knows? They have created some bakso is from Indonesia originally, but they are sold to the bakso from China coming to Indonesia, very cheaper price. Are you willing to buy the bakso from China? It's very cheap. But your mindset is bakso from Indonesia. You know very well the quality from Indonesia. It's the mindset. If you love to buy the product from China, you supposed to be, you must have a limited sources of money or you might have some problem with purchasing higher good, higher prices good. Or otherwise you will go to higher prices good. It's all the mindset of the people or the, or the consumers, I think. I think this is the problem with the consumer in the worldwide. Okay. For example, if you, if you go to London, especially, people are going to London. This is my experience, sharing, sharing my experience. I go to London. And I purchase some t-shirt, uh, welcome to United Kingdom, welcome to London. When I bring back, everybody thought that I'm buying from any cheap market from Malaysia or any cheap market from Thailand, because it's made from Thailand. It's made from China. Yeah. I thought it's made from London. And nobody want to accept my gift, you know, they thought that I'm buying from the cheap market. It's actually from London. Yes, I no buy the same. <laughs> yes, it's cheap. <laughs> 
But when yeah. I come to Malaysia, the same good is very expensive. But I buy the thing from London. I thought I'm giving some, even uh, I'm giving to my friend. He said, oh, you buy from cheap market? No, it's from London. But it shows that it's made from China. So everybody yeah. knows yeah. that, okay, maybe China is, might be from the cheap market. Okay. It's from London. <laughs> Okay, uh, since we are running out of time, even though actually uh, more questions coming, we can like prolong the session. We must stop now. So uh, we want to give the appreciation for our keynote speaker oh. today. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, since we cannot give any token of appreciation, so we okay, okay, no problem. Yes, we are happy to give this certificate to you, Dr. Nanta Kumar Loganata. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, from University of Technology Malaysia for sharing your valuable knowledge as a keynote speaker today in, in the International Conference on Biospheric Harmony Advanced Research 2020. Toward Society 5.0, our, how interdisciplinary research contributes to a sustainable smart society. Okay, signed by the professor, Dr. Tirta Mursitama. Oh, <laughs> thank you thank so much, you. Uh, Dr. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, and thank you thank so you much for, for Twitter as well.